بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام ميم ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على من بعث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته It's absolutely appalling Really appalling السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Ah, that's it. Now I feel a bit more like lecturing, inshallah. There's people, alive people there. The topic of my speech, inshallah, is about calling to the way of your Lord. Calling to the way of your Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I want to begin by mentioning a short story about something that happened many years ago and it's relating, relate, related to myself as some of you might be aware I myself have been I was born and brought up in a Muslim family by the time I got to the teenage years I was a Muslim who didn't really believe in God a Muslim who had basically rejected the concept or the very fundamentals of Islam. But Muslim by name, we would go to the masjid because our father would drag us to the masjid. We would run away during Tarawih prayers while the Imam's praying for an hour down on London Road and then back before the last witr. And when dad asks, where have you been? Oh, I was in the back row. I had to make wudu and then I got to the back row. We had no interest whatsoever with Islam. No interest in Islam at all. Until a period came, I was studying. Um, and a period came where I came home from school one day and I saw a small booklet on the floor open the door and there's a small booklet <clears throat> and the booklet is called do you know this book so i thought that's a strange title how can i know the book before i've even read it and it had no indication that it was some something to do with religion so i picked up this book if i'd have known that it was related to religion i would have not i would have ignored it straight away but I picked up this book and in this book and remember this is well before Peace TV and you know Zakir Naik and all of these things where we, we didn't really have any knowledge of science in the Quran <clears throat> so one of the things we I, was, I started reading this book and it was talking about some of the very scientific facts that were mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago it talked about how the earth went around the sun. It talked about embryology, the different stages of a fetus. It talked about the water cycle. It talked about mountains being pegs holding down the earth's crust. It talked about the universe expanding as time goes on. So being into science, I was quite amazed by this thought. The book explained that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam could no, not read nor write. So I was quite amazed at some of these things. So I went back to the Quran to check, you know. But before this, just literally two days after reading this book, I went back to school. We were doing A-levels. I was in the lower sixth. And I was in a physics lesson and we had the most boringest teacher that you could possibly imagine. He was a very intelligent guy, extremely intelligent. He was doing some research and 
he was doing cutting edge research so that he knew things that nobody else in the world knew about physics because he was the one discovering some of these things and obviously that made him a little bit arrogant and I remember on this particular day he was walking up and down you can imagine a short stocky fellow and he had his trousers somewhere up here quite contrary to the fashion today and he used to wear braces that hold up the trousers and he would walk up and down he'd never look at the audience and he would play with his braces okay and we used to hope that you know he'd pull it one day and just let go by mistake but he'd be walking up and down and on that particular day he said he was talking about something or other I wasn't really paying attention until he said that the universe has is expanding so obviously I read this two days ago in the little booklet do you know this book so I put up my hand I said sir how long ago did we discover this how long ago did we discover this and I remember his reaction it was a defining moment in my life he puffed up his chest he lifted his head and he said oh it's been about 40 years now 40 years but this was mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago I was flabbergasted I went home and in this small booklet it referred to another book it said please refer to a book called the Bible the Quran and science by Dr. Morris Bukai many of you have probably heard of this book so I looked for the nearest religious person where can I get this book and I found my mom so I said mom where can I find this book the Bible the Quran and science by Dr. Morris Bukai and she said it's on your bookshelf she had actually put it on my bookshelf hoping that one day I will read this book so I read through this book and it talked about the Quran and some of the scientific miracles in the Quran and it talked about the Bible and I went to the various churches to find out about what they have to say in response to the claims made by Dr. Bukai but eventually I went around in a circle even though I was so averse to Islam I eventually came back to Islam itself through this booklet and I went away to study eventually and you know the story goes on but there's something there's someone unknown in this story and for me this person is the most important person in this story and that is the person who posted this booklet through my door I don't know who this person is I don't know how old he is or she is I don't know if it's if they're a man or a woman I don't know if they're young or or old or if they're rich or poor or which nationality they are I don't know their ethnicity I don't know their education I don't know anything about this person but this person by doing a deed which may have taken just a few seconds or a few minutes posting this booklet through my door he changed my whole life my whole life changed and for me this person what I find most amazing about this is that every act of worship that I do whether it's a prayer whether it's you know any act of worship that I do fasting whether it be giving zakah giving lectures any act of worship that I do this person inshallah gets a copy of that deed isn't that amazing yes or no that's amazing and I don't know anything about this person in fact this person may not even know who I am but they felt the need to post this booklet through my door and how many other people or how many other people's doors did this person post this booklet through and imagine this person might turn up on the day of judgment because of these few people or maybe many people that they have managed to by the grace of Allah to help to guide by the grace of Allah to Islam 
how much of their rewards has this person taken? For me, this is amazing. On the day of judgment, and this is the important point here. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Addalu ala al khair kafailihi, kafailihi, aw kama qal. That the one who guides another to do good, he is like the one who did that good himself. He gets a copy of that person's good deeds. And the first person who actually did the good, no deed, no reward is wiped off his slate. It's a complete copy. So you can imagine by giving da'wah to a person, whether that be with the tongue, whether that be financially by sponsoring something, a CD, a book, a DVD, whatever that may be. Whether that is by physically posting or handing out leaflets or books or something of this nature. If one person accepts Islam, brothers and sisters, through this, you have got a brand new opportunity, a whole new life of good deeds. And what's amazing for me is that it's not just about the person's prayer or his fasting or his seeking knowledge or his giving da'wah or his doing hajj or anything of that nature. It's not just these acts of worship of the limbs. In fact, you'll be rewarded if one person accepts Islam through something you've done. You get rewarded for that very person's Iman. His Iman. What does this mean? Let's think about this. Let's stop. Let's ponder. It means when the person is sleeping, he's sleeping at night, but he's sleeping as a Muslim, you are getting reward at that time, Allahu Akbar. Because he's sleeping with Iman. He's sleeping as a Muslim. This, brothers and sisters, is what keeps me in da'wah. Are there any programmers out here? Put your hands up. There's a few programmers. Now, I used to be a programmer. And one thing I can say are, is that we programmers are probably one of the most laziest group of people ever, right? We don't like to do things manually. If you want to delete 10 files, you write a script to delete them. You don't sit there right clicking and delete, right brother? You, we're very lazy people. We don't like to do work. And da'wah, in a sense, is almost like outsourcing ibadah. Right? It's like outsourcing your worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You give da'wah to someone, he accepts Islam. Every time the person prays, you get the reward for that person's prayer. Every time the person gives charity, you get the reward for that. Isn't that a good deal? Yes or no? Yes or no? It's an amazing deal. But da'wah requires certain conditions. And the first of these conditions is al-ikhlas, is sincerity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ إِمْرِئٍ مَا نَوَى Every action, actions are but by intention and every man shall have that which he intends. So a person when he gives da'wah, he should know why he is calling someone to Islam. It's not to just rack up the shahada numbers. It's not just to feel proud or to call someone over to your way of life. No, it's for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, we should have humility when we're giving da'wah. We should realize that we're not doing Allah a favor and we're not doing anybody else a favor. But rather when we're giving da'wah, it is we that has been, it, it is we that have been favored and blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a privilege to be an ambassador of Allah's deen. It is a privilege. It is a privilege to be doing the very work of the Messenger of Allah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Number three, knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Ballighu anni walaw ayah. 
narrate from me even if it is one ayah. But of course, the condition is that you have to know the ayah before you call other people to it. You have to know that this is an ayah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرًا أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي Say, this is my path. Say, he tells the Prophet Muhammad to say, this is my path. I call to Allah upon sure and certain knowledge, I and those who follow me. So knowledge. We have to have patience. Number four. We, Allah says in the Quran, sabr and enjoin each other to having patience. Nuh السلام, gave da'wah for over 900 years. Can you imagine this? And he gave da'wah in the daytime at night time. He gave da'wah in the morning, in the evening. He gave da'wah publicly and privately. He gave da'wah in groups and individually. He gave da'wah in every single way possible. And some narrations say only 80 people, only 80 people accepted Islam in 900 years. So we have to be patient. The Prophet ﷺ told us about a man in the past, a Muslim man who would be put in a hole and he would be sawn in half from his head down. And his body would be torn with iron combs and yet he would not ever give up his religion. Patience. This is in Bukhari. Number five, we must have forbearance. And what is forbearance? It means that we tolerate and overlook the faults of others when they harm us. We all know the very famous story of Ta'if. When the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he walked to Ta'if. And Ta'if from Mecca is about an hour's drive. And then when you get to near Ta'if, there's a mountain that you have to climb. It takes 20 minutes by car. And then another 20 minutes when you get to the top of the mountain from Hada to Ta'if. So it's about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes drive from Mecca. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam walked this distance in the desert heat for no other purpose but to call people to La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. And what did he find? He found the children of the people of Ta'if. Not the adults, not the youths, but the children in order to increase the humiliation. He found the children of the people of Ta'if throwing stones at him such that he was chased out of the city of Ta'if. And remember, stoning somebody is only applied in an Islamic state to an adulterer. But yet, the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was being stoned by the children of the people of Ta'if until he was chased out of the city. For what? For money? No. For position? Power? Leadership? No. Just to call people to La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. When he got to the outskirts of Ta'if, he sat down. And I want you to imagine this scene. His sandals are covered in blood. You know, when you're wearing sandals and the sandals are sticking to your feet, not because of water, but because of blood. The very blood of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had trickled down his body into his sandals. And his sandals were covered in blood. And he sat down in this pain. And Jibreel Alayhi Salam, the angel Jibreel came and said, Assalamu Alaikum Ya Rasulullah. He said, Wa salam Ya Jibreel. He said, I've come with the angel who is in charge of the mountain. And all you have to do is say yes. And this angel will lift this mountain and crush the people of Ta'if below this mountain because of what they've done to Allah's Prophet. You know what the Messenger of Allah said? 
He said, no, O Jibreel. He said, even though these people did not accept Islam, they rejected the message. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that their offspring are saved. Their offspring are saved from the hellfire. Subhanallah. When you think about this, and then you think that Ta'if today is a city filled with Muslims. It is a place where people pray five times a day. In fact, in the very lifetime of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that people, those people, the people of Ta'if, they accepted Islam. When you think about this, you think, SubhanAllah, look at the sacrifices that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. In the Battle of Uhud, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was fighting among the companions. And Uqba ibn Rabi'a, the mushrik, the polytheist, he threw a spear and it went through the cheek of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam such that his incisor, his molar tooth came out. And while he was in this state of pain, and SubhanAllah, when you think about toothache, all right, toothache is a very painful experience. And, and people can sometimes handle, you know, a lot more pain, much more grievous harm. But when a small tooth comes out or some kind of pain in the tooth, that's unbearable for many people. Imagine the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his, his tooth came out and his cheeks got a hole in it where the spear has gone through. What does he say in this state? He says, how can Allah show mercy? Yes, he's thinking about mercy. How can Allah show mercy to a people who have done this to their Prophet? He was more concerned about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show them mercy because of what they've done to the Prophet of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In one narration it is said that when blood was coming, flowing in a battle from the Prophet sallallahu he's trying to gather the blood. He was trying to hold the blood so it doesn't touch the ground so that the ground would not testify against these people. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ From above the seven heavens, Allah describes the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, we have not sent you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have not sent you except as a mercy to the world. As a mercy to the world. And this leads us to the next point which is to be gentle and kind in our da'wah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَمْ فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكَ That it is by the mercy of Allah that you are kind to them. And had you been harsh and severe against them, then they would have certainly broken away from you. Now imagine if Allah is telling the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you, O Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you, the best of da'is, were harsh, were, you know, were not kind, you were harsh in your da'wah, in your approach, they would have run away from you. Then what about us? If the best of da'is, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was told that if you're harsh, then they would have run away from you. Then why do we expect when we are harsh against them that people come flocking to the religion of Allah? No, never. We have to be soft in our approach, gentle and kind. Number seven, we have to practice what we preach. And the first thing that we often do when we call people to Islam is to tell them to read the book of Allah. Yes or no? Yes or no? So let me ask a question today. How many people here have read the book of Allah, the Quran, in a language that they understand, a translation, 
from cover to cover, put your hand up. Subhanallah, that's a disgrace. That is a disgrace. Maybe 20 or 30% of the people of this hall. We're not talking about a nightclub. We're not doing this survey in a nightclub where Muslims are there. We're talking about people who have come to a religious lecture. 20, 30, 40% of them only have read the Quran in a language that they understand. Oh, you who believe. Why do you say? Why do you say that which you do not do? Why is it that you do that you say that which you do not do? We tell other people to come and read the book of Allah. We tell our neighbors or other people, we tell them to come and read the book of Allah. But we have not even read the book of Allah ourselves from, from cover to cover. That's a disgrace. That's an absolute disgrace. Yes or no? I can't hear you. Is that a disgrace? It's an absolute disgrace, brothers and sisters. So firstly, let's make a resolution before we move forward. Let's make a resolution that we will make sure that within the next two months, by 25th of February, in the next two months, everybody will have read the Quran in a language that they understand. Who's going to try and do this resolution? Put your hand up. I want to see everyone's hands up. Can I have four witnesses, please? Four brothers, please come to the front. Come to the front, please. I want you to bear witness in front of Allah. Put your hands up. Who's going to attempt this resolution, inshallah? Everyone. Come on. Yalla. Hands up. Keep it up, brother. I'm not going to look at the sisters. You're bearing witness, huh? Allah bear witness. Two months you've got. Sit down, brothers. To read the Quran in a language that you understand, a translation. Something practical to go away. It is really a disgrace. And sometimes, subhanAllah, when I was young, I used to wonder that how comes the people that have accepted Islam, they weren't Muslims, maybe they were Christians or atheists or Hindus or whatever they were, and they accept Islam, their Iman is much stronger and they're much more active in calling people to Islam then people have been born into Muslim families. And then it occurred to me that perhaps one of the primary reasons for this is because the Muslims who are born in a Muslim family, they've not even read the book of Allah. Whereas as for the convert who's accepted Islam, he is at least bothered to read the book of Allah. That's why he came to Islam in the first place, in many cases. So practice what we preach. Number eight. We must make dua. And as I said, it is about calling people to Allah. So it's not about winning arguments. It's not about proving our point. It is about calling people and saving them from the hellfire. And what is important is to understand, as some of the scholars have said, that if a person truly understands the nature of the hellfire, he would never want the hellfire for anyone, not even his enemy. Let me repeat that. If a person truly understands the nature of the hellfire, he would not want that for anyone. Rather, he would feel sorry for his enemy or a sinner or a disbeliever because of these short few moments that he has spent disobeying Allah, the sin of the hell, the, the punishment of the hellfire is really something that is unbearable. And let's take an example. I want you to all imagine a non-Muslim, either a friend or somebody that you know. 
Somebody that you know. I want you to imagine this person. It might be the next door neighbor. When she comes out to deliver the rubbish and drop it outside. It could be your boss at work or your colleague at university. Could be anyone. I want you to imagine one person that you think, hmm, that's an, that's an okay person. Have you done that? Yes or no? Yes? Okay. Now imagine this person. And it was said to you that you have one week to convince this person to accept Islam. Otherwise, he's going to go in a tandoor. Do you know what a tandoor is? Who knows what a tandoor is? Tandoor is where you make naan. Okay, in Mecca, they have loads of little tandoor places. And you have this counter, and you're on the other side of the counter, and you've got some kids often on the opposite side, and they're making these fresh hot bread, fresh naans and rotis. And even though you're a good few meters away from the tandoor, this oven, you're still feeling the heat. Just a few minutes there, sometimes in the morning after Fajr, it's very hot. And you're standing right opposite the tandoor, just a few meters away, and you're starting to sweat already. You're starting to sweat already. I want you, to, want you to imagine that you have one week to convince this person to accept Islam, otherwise he's going to be put into this tandoor for just half an hour. Only half an hour, no more. What would you do? What would you do? I'm asking you a question. Yes? What would you do, brother? You'd convert him to Islam, get a gun out, you know. <laughs> no, how would you convert him? How would you try? You'd give him da'wah. What would you do practically? What's the first step you'd do? Sorry? Okay, so you tell him, if you don't get converted to Islam, I'm going to put you in the tandoor. <laughs> okay. Anything else? What if you don't know how to give da'wah? You don't know how to give da'wah. What are you going to do? Go to Aira. <laughs> All right. It's Christmas Day. Aira lines are closed. Let's see. Now what? Sorry, Eid. <laughs> Make sure you're listening. You go to YouTube, how to do da'wah. Right? Yes? Find a leaflet. Oh, what was that booklet that Abu Abdul Salam was talking about? Let me go print that booklet out. Right or wrong? You would go out of your way, I hope, if you cared for this person, to give him a leaflet, to sit down, invite him for a kebab and that naan, and say, look, you know where this naan came from? <laughs> All right? You would go out of your way. And if you don't know how to give da'wah, you will learn. You will jolly well learn. Right or wrong? Yes or no? Tell me. Yes. But that shows us something very sad that we're all willing to go out of our way to give da'wah to save a person from a tandoor. But subhanallah, while we know and we believe in the Quran and we know that the hellfire exists and we know that paradise exists and we know that the people who reject the message of Allah and who die upon that state will enter the hellfire for eternity. We know this, but we don't give da'wah. We don't spend our days and nights giving da'wah. When we go to work, we say, hello, John. Nice day. Well, if you're in East London, it'll be all right, mate. How's it going, mate? Depending on where you are. We joke with them, we laugh with them, we play with them. We exchange emails, we do all sorts of things. We maybe invite them to our houses. That is hypocritical. That's not true friendship. That is, that makes us a bunch of hypocrites. We smile in their faces, but we know deep down these people are going to the hellfire. What kind of disgusting people have we become?
We have no empathy. And this is why the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it would pain him. It would pain him when people did not accept Islam because he knew the reality of where they're heading. So this is important. We should make dua in the last third of the night. Oh Allah, guide this person to Islam. Oh Allah, make me a means to guide this person to Islam. You save that person from the hellfire and then you get a copy of that person's deeds. Finally, brothers and sisters, number nine, one of the conditions, the ninth and final condition of giving da'wah is that we must have a close relationship to Allah. How is it possible that we could be calling to Allah but we are so far away from Allah ourselves? Rather, we should make sure that we in our personal piety, we get closer to Allah, we engage in dhikr, in dua, in remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in reading the Quran, in all of the acts of worship that we can do to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we make dua to Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides these people. I hope inshallah, that we can go back to the beginning of this lecture and really think about this unknown person. This unknown person that pushed a small leaflet or a booklet through my door. And through this, this changed my life. And this person on the Day of Judgment will have a whole load of deeds that he did not even know existed. And Allah knows, if we convert someone or we help to convert someone to Islam, maybe on the Day of Judgment, our good deeds are not enough to get us into paradise. But maybe that small 50p that we gave to produce a booklet like that book. Do you know that book? That small five minutes of our time that we spent giving somebody a DVD or a booklet or the half an hour that we spent giving da'wah to someone. Maybe the person didn't accept Islam in front of your very eyes. Maybe it took a day. It took a week, it even took a year. Maybe it took 10 years, but the person clicked because of something you said 10 years ago. And that person becomes a pious person or he does good actions. And then he teaches his children and their children and their children. Suddenly you've got a mountain of deeds in front of you because of something small that you did. You come on the day of judgment, you're between paradise and hell. You don't know which way you're going. Your deeds are showing that you're going in the wrong direction. May Allah protect us from that. And then suddenly a mountain of good deeds come. You ask, oh Allah, where did these deeds come from? And it is because of somebody else's good deeds. But you had been the one who had helped guide them to Islam. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to motivate us to give da'wah and to be of those people who are examples and are exemplary in giving da'wah and practicing what we preach. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq of giving da'wah in every form and fashion. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those people who, even though we did not become companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this life, O oh Allah, make us his companions in the hereafter. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.